Amen. It is good to be in his house tonight. It's good to be together. We didn't have church for two days. It it feels like it had been forever since we've had church. Seems like we had a lot of church last week. I think we did. But it was a lot of great church. And it is good to be back together on Wednesday night, worshiping together. Our kids are downstairs in classes. Our youth are having service tonight and here we are together the older wiser group upstairs amen you know on on wednesday nights when the youth and children are downstairs i I don't want you to be scared of these front pews here there's nothing radioactive there there's nothing i don't think they've left any residue on the pews that be afraid to sit in or you you are welcome on Wednesday nights to venture into these areas Uh, I feel like I've got a buffer around me right now it's like nobody wants to get too close uh, why don't you just welcome somebody close by and tell them it's good to see them on this Wednesday night If anybody's been waiting for an opportunity to move closer, this is it. This is your chance. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated tonight. This past Wednesday, our evangelist, Brother Green, preached about the momentum of sacrifice. Thank you, Brother Austin. Thank you for taking that initiative. The Lord's going to bless you for that. Brother Green preached about the momentum of sacrifice. There's a certain direction to momentum. It is always moving forward. It is never in retreat. It's never moving backwards. It's never a lesser act. There's a certain direction forward when it comes to sacrifice. It compels us to reach further, to give more, to advance the kingdom. I, I want to express my appreciation to you for your sacrifice. Many of you have responded to that, that challenge of the Holy Ghost that he presented to us, and you have perhaps fasted more than you ever have fasted before. Maybe you have spent more time in prayer of the past week or two weeks than you had been. You have committed yourself to more consistent prayer, to more daily prayer. Maybe you have been more intentional in sharing your testimony and witnessing to others. You certainly have given sacrificially. Maybe you noticed our social media before service. We announced the efforts of CLC related to Sheaves for Christ giving, supporting missions and ministry around the world. And uh, once again, our church just went above and beyond, went the second mile in sacrificial giving with an offering of $31,000 for Sheaves for Christ. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your giving. There's something about investing outside of our local assembly here, whether it's in our community, North America, around the world, global missions, whatever it is. I just believe God God honors that kind of sacrifice. It's one thing, and, and it's very needed and important, and I'm thankful for it when you sacrifice here. But one could say, well, that benefits you. That benefits your family. That benefits your church in a very tangible way. But when you sacrifice outside of our local assembly here and you put that finance into the hands of God and say, God, we're, we're more concerned than just what is happening right here and in our community. We recognize we are part of a global church. We're part of your kingdom. And anytime we can invest in your kingdom, some might say, well, that's not going to help or bless your local assembly. I would argue with them that absolutely when we invest outside of the church, God is going to bless here. He's going to bless our church. He's going to bless our families. He's going to bless our finances. He's going to take care of our our need here. We we need a whole lot more than $31,000 to take care of the needs of our church. Just monthly, we need a lot more than that. 
So when we take that and we put it in the hands of God, he's got all the resources in the world then he's going to bless and he's going to take care of the needs that we have here locally. That's just the law of the kingdom. It's the law of, so of sowing and reaping in the kingdom. So thank you for your sacrifice. We were part of an absolutely miraculous uh, response to the, the giving towards Sheeps for Christ this year. Last year, an all-time record was set of $5.3 million given toward that cause. And on a year when Youth Congress took place this year, and probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 million plus million was invested to send 37,000 people to Youth Congress this summer, in, in the midst of that fundraising, an incredible, miraculous offering of $6.7 million was given towards Sheaves for Christ this year. That testifies to me that we're part of a movement that believes in missions, that believes in investing in the next generation, that believes in the, in the work of the kingdom of God. That's what your offering was part of and helped to accomplish. So thank you for that. There is no status quo when it comes to sacrifice. There's no such thing as having arrived in the kingdom of God. Like we've made it somehow so we can just kind of rest, sit back, and relax. The apostle Paul said, I have not yet attained. He said, I have not arrived. I haven't made it. I am not yet perfect. So I follow after to apprehend. I'm letting go of some things and I'm reaching forth unto the high calling of God. He compelled us to conquer complacency and to pursue sacrifice. I've been on a quest this year, I've mentioned this several times, consumed with this concept of capacity and its relationship to our potential, both individual potential, our potential as families, and certainly our collective potential as a church. And I'll be very honest with you tonight, I don't have it all figured out. I'll echo the words of the Apostle Paul. I, I, I have not arrived I'm not exactly sure just where this journey is going to take me, this passionate pursuit of capacity. I haven't obtained all that I believe God has for me, all that he has for our church. I believe there are some things ahead of us that God is calling us to. I'm not satisfied with where we are. I believe we can be content, we can be at peace with where God has us and yet still not be satisfied and, and not be apathetic or complacent with where we are. Brother Green made this declaration to us that the wait is over. The wait is over. The future is now. I don't believe that our purpose in our greatest days are so far out there ahead of us I don't think they're so far beyond us that, that today we just have to be satisfied with mediocre, average, this is just it, this is where we are. No, I believe that future is now. I, I'm claiming that promise that the wait is over, that the promises that God has for us are for today. The things that have been prophesied to us, uh, they're for today. Revival is not a future expectation. It is a very current, um, relevant reality. It is here. The prophecies of the Word of God, they're happening all around us. Uh, revival's happening harvest. Jesus said, don't say that the harvest is, is months down the road. Lift up your eyes. Look around you. The harvest is now. The harvest is here. It is here. So let me give you a little scriptural context for our topic and where I believe the Lord's going to take us in his word tonight. First Chronicles chapter four, verse 10, a prayer that you're probably very familiar with. It's been popularized the last few years and um, the sellers of books and little trinkets and knickknacks that have this prayer on it have made a lot of money here recently in the past few years. It's the prayer of Jabez. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10 says this, He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Everybody say, expand my territory. Expand my territory. Increase my reach. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted him his request. Now, I believe, I believe the prayer of Jabez is an appropriate desire. It's, it's what I've just expressed in the last few minutes. It's an appropriate request. 
God, bless me and expand my territory, increase my reach, increase my capacity. Be with me in all that I do. Keep me from all trouble and pain. I, I'm on that quest on a personal level and collectively as a church to expand and increase our capacity. But I believe in this scripture in light of the big picture looking at scripture. I believe there's some missing elements in the white space of that verse. You ever heard anybody talk about the white spaces of scripture? There's a lot that happens in the white space. We, we don't get the full picture of everything and every scenario, every situation that happened. There are some things that happen in the white space. God, I believe, gave us everything we need, but there's some things that happen there and we don't get all of the answer all of the time from just one verse. We have to look at the context and we have to look at other supporting scriptures and principles from the word of God. And in this particular verse, I, I think there's some missing elements in that white space. Maybe some spiritual disciplines and lifestyle principles that we can discover from other passages of scripture that will help us to expand our territory. I want to pray right now before we go any further. I, I want you to be very intentional in this moment and pray very sincerely and very personally that your heart would be open and receptive to what God wants to communicate to us tonight. Would you do that with me right now? Would you pray with me? I, I want you to make it a very personal prayer and open your heart to the Lord tonight. Father, we thank you, Jesus, for your presence, and we thank you for your word that is alive and quick and powerful. I am praying tonight that our hearts would be open and receptive to you. God, that you would order and direct our steps in your word. I am praying that you would anoint my mind and my spirit, God, that I would be sensitive to your presence and to what you desire to communicate to us. I pray that you would help me to be able to communicate what I feel in my spirit. Lord, where you are leading us, the journey that we are on, where you are taking us individually and collectively, I pray tonight that your will would be done. God, that you would speak to us, that we would hear as a church family, that we would hear what the Spirit is speaking to us tonight, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. We are living in an increasingly secular and humanistic, humanistic society. When you consider the direction of society, there is an obvious destination, at least obvious to the spiritually sensitive of our day. There is an obvious direction when it comes to our society. This direction will end in self-destruction, ultimately in eternal damnation for too many. Humanity, compelled by the spirit of our age, is seeking to push God out of every arena of life. Using the weapons of political correctness and tolerance, these forces of evil desire nothing less than complete control and are attempting to eradicate God, even the mere reference of God from every aspect of our society. Trying to eradicate God from the workplace. You have to be so careful what you say, how you say it, how you talk about your faith because there's a spirit in our age that is trying to eradicate God from the workplace, eradicate him from our schools. Prayer in the word of God was removed many, many years ago, but the intensity of this effort has increased in recent years with a very militant mindset of our, our culture, this society that would like to remove any kind of, of mention of God or of theology from our textbooks, even revising history, going back and trying to change what was taught about the past. I thank God for some young people and some young adults through programs like Project 7 and Campus Ministry that are taking prayer and the Word of God back onto our school campuses. It happened all over our county just this afternoon with multiple P7 clubs where there was prayer and the Word of God was taught on our campuses. Government politics, the, the judicial branch, we're seeing this effort to eradicate God. Got to get rid of the Ten Commandments. What's so wrong with the Ten Commandments, the very foundation of our laws and judicial system? Some who refuse to say under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. 
discrimination claims because of religious beliefs. Even in the home, our society would seek to eradicate God from the home. How would that happen, you may ask? Nobody's going to come in my home and tell me that I can't talk about God and I can't pray and I can't spend time in Bible study in my home. I would ask you this question tonight. Do they have to come in and say that to you? Are you taking the time to pray and talk about God and declare your beliefs and have Bible studies in your homes? You see, the attack comes in subtle and insidious ways because it's through distractions. It's through influences and voices. Every form of media, the news, entertainment, Hollywood, social media are tools of mass communication. And when used outside of the purpose and plan that God would have for us, they can be tools and weapons of mass confusion and mass destruction. If we're not extremely careful, extremely diligent, extremely discerning when it comes to the time that we're spending and the voices that we're allowing to speak into our home. If we're not careful, we will allow God to be removed from our home. And even religion, our society would seek to eradicate God from religion. Yes, this secular humanistic philosophy of our day desires religion without God. It's the only acceptable form of religion today, really, is religion without God. There's a book that was written, written, written recently, Where Will Man Take Us? I, I want you to listen to the words of this modern author, Atul Jalan. I want you to listen to the words of this man, the title of his book, Where Will Man Take Us? The subtitle is this. Listen to this. This is the subtitle, The Bold Story of the Man That Technology is Creating. Now, that statement right there just kind of gives me the creeps. That's his subtitle, The Bold Story of the Man That Technology is Creating. Think about that. Think about how technology is shaping our behavior. Think about the habits that we are forming. Think about the time that it is consuming. So this author is a friend of Galen Walters. I've mentioned Galen multiple times, different settings. He's uh, Him and his wife, Mickey, have been in service with us here. Uh, He has spoken to our leadership team. He is an apostolic. He's the author of Into His Marvelous Light Bible Study. He's a very successful secular businessman. And so he has met this author, Atul. And so Atul sent him a copy of this book. Atul knows who he is and knows what he believes. And so Atul sent him a copy of this book, and he wrote this note to him, Dear Galen, Where Will Man Take Us is my first book. This is something I've been thinking about and working on for a while now. Over the past few years, our biology has been busy merging with our technology. And this will transform us as a species, will change us as a society. This will change us in many ideas we hold close to our heart, democracy, nationalism, jobs, our idea of money, love, sex, much else. I just got a few pre-launch copies from Penguin, and I thought I would send you one. I hope you consider it interesting enough to debate or review it. Do tell me what you think. So, Brother Galen Walters got a copy of this book, and he sent me a few excerpts from it that I want to share with you. If they'll go to the next slide. This is from a page in his book. This is Mr. Atul's perspective obviously a very biased perspective, his view of religion, and I think I would say his very narrow view of religion that has, has been used perhaps to accomplish some, some things that were not within the purpose and plan of God. But, but listen to this. Have today's religions passed their use-by date? 
Religion has fought against every single thing. Again, this is his perspective, has fought against every single thing that we hold sacred today, against free speech, democracy, sex education, reproductive technologies, reproductive rights, stem cell research, women's and civil rights, and the advancement of science. Again, his perspective. And who has religion fought for over the years? Religion has aligned with human sacrifice, inquisitions, war, slavery, intolerance, fascism, genocide, torture, despotism, child abuse. Look at who religion's friends are. It displays a fondness for the supernatural. That's okay. The authoritarian, the misogynist, the anti-democratic, the anti-intellectual, the anti-scientific, the anti-progressive. So this is the argument being presented by this man, his perspective of religion. Before I go to the next page, I just want to say this. We, we, we have to have a voice in our society, in our culture today, because we can't allow people like this man to de- define the terms, to define the language that's being used, to define religion. We have to be able to have a voice and present what is true religion. What does the Bible say about it? And who are we really? That's not me, and that's not you, and that's not Christian Life Center. But there are people like Atul who are trying to define the, the terms and the language that's being used. So let's look at this next page. Without doubt, religions and gods have been our stumbling blocks, bringing us to our knees at times. As a civilization, would we have been better off without them. With our newfound abilities to manipulate the genome, rearrange the atom, and augment the mind, will we soon be able to defeat pain, disease, suffering, and maybe even death? When the cardiologists, the oncologists, and the geneticists exist, why do I need God? Why should I die hoping for eternal life in heaven when science offers immortality right here on earth? Without suffering and death, their crutches, the religions of today will lose their raison d'etre or their reason for existence. Is obsolescence staring him and his establishment religion in the face? And Brother Galen had written on that page, a fool's folly intellect. You know, it's possible for man to outsmart himself. It's possible for man to outsmart himself. And this is a case of intellectualism leading somebody to believe that they can create a world where God doesn't need to exist anymore. A a society that is trying to do everything it can to eradicate God from every aspect of that society, to remove him completely, less God everywhere is their desire and their mantra. It is the humanistic, secular mentality of our day that is leading our society on a path toward destruction. But I would make a declaration to you today that Mr. Atul is false, that he is misguided, that he is wrong, that more than ever, we need more God. We need more of the word of God. We need more direction from God. We need more of the Holy Ghost in our lives every day. We need more of his anointing. We need more power. We need more of his mercy. We need more of his grace. We need more of his love. We need more God than ever before. I'm not looking for opportunities to push him away, to remove him or eradicate him. I need God every day. I want him in every aspect of my life. We need more of God. So my question to you tonight is this. How much God do you want? How much God do you want? Enough to appease your conscience but not make you uncomfortable? Enough to take care of your needs? but not challenge you or convict you or ask you for more? How much God do you really want? How much of the secular and the humanistic will you allow in your life? Because that ultimately will determine the limitations of your personal capacity for God. How much God do you want? This is a fact tonight. I declare it unequivocally. This is a fact. You have right now as much of God as you want. I'm just going to let that settle in. You have as much 
of God as you want. He's not withholding himself from you. If there is a void, if there is emptiness, it is because we have limited that capacity for God in us. That he's not able to get in. But I believe tonight that he stands at the door and he knocks. He stands at the door of our heart and he knocks. And the question is, will we make room for him and will we open the door and let him in? How much of God do you want in your life? How much of God do you want in your day? How much of God do you want in your home? How much of God do you want in your marriage? How much of God do you want involved when it comes to your employment? How much of God do you want involved when it comes to to dealing with your past? How much of God do you want involved when it comes to your future? How much of God do you want involved when it comes to your purpose and, and your ministry, what God is calling you to? How much God do you want? As I started this journey of discovery as it relates to capacity, I, I've asked myself a couple of questions. What is capacity? How do I increase it? How do I fulfill my potential as it relates to capacity? I'm going to be speaking on this subject in two parts. And, and tonight, I'm, I'm speaking on how to increase capacity. Now, don't worry. I know I'm giving my full title right now, but I'm, I'm already halfway through. Okay. How much God do you want? How do we increase that capacity? In our next session, we'll be talking about how to fulfill our personal potential. During our Vision and Values series, when we were talking about growth and excellence, we discussed six areas of personal growth potential. I'm going to go back and revisit those tonight because the sum of those six areas equal our personal capacity. Those six areas are the spiritual, the physical, the mental, the emotional, the relational, and the financial. Those six areas, the sum of those six areas equal our personal capacity. It equals, those things together equal the potential that God has placed within us. If we want more of God, then we have to be intentional in our desires and behaviors in each of these areas. Somebody said that there's a God-sized hole in everybody's heart. Anybody ever heard that? There's a God-sized hole in, everybody, in everybody's heart. You can't put possessions. You can't put fame. You can't put anything in there. It's got to be God. My question to whoever came up with that statement, I want to figure out, how do I make that space as large as possible? If there's a God-sized hole in my heart, how do I increase that to its maximum potential? Jabez prayed, expand my territory. That's my prayer tonight. I believe the Lord is going to help us individually and collectively to expand that territory. But there's a key to the fulfillment of that prayer. And I believe one of the keys we find in Isaiah chapter 54. This is the scripture that we started the year with, our theme scripture at the very beginning of this year as we began to talk about deeper. Isaiah chapter 54, verse number one says this, Sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate, one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Don't hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Notice this. This is not just a, a, a simple prophecy or promise. It is a commandment from the Lord. It's a conditional promise. There's some things that we have to do in order to see the promise fulfilled. He said the barren must break forth into singing. It's not a response that you would expect from the barren, but he said the barren must break forth, must rejoice, must sing, must worship, and then there's going to be the fulfillment of the promise. The barren will bear. There's going to be offspring. But first, there is a responsibility upon the barren. You have to break forth in singing and worship. Notice this commandment. 
You enlarge the place of your tent. You let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. You're the one that can't hold back. You lengthen your cords and you strengthen your stakes. And that's our responsibility. God said, this is what you have to do. Then he said, you're going to spread abroad to the right and to the left. That's the promise. The next generation will possess the nations and inhabit the desolate cities. That's the prophecy. That's the promise. But the claiming of new territory is your personal responsibility. The fulfillment of the prophecy is God's responsibility. The claiming of new territory is the result of us taking personal responsibility to dig deeper, strengthening those stakes, and to reach further, lengthening those cords. It is the timeless pattern of growth, both as an individual and collectively as a church. And for the foundation is our safety, and we have to strengthen that foundation. But our reach is the fulfillment of our purpose, and we have to lengthen that reach. It's our mission. It's our calling. A personal commitment to grow, a collective commitment to grow. So how do we do this? How do we increase this capacity? We're going to look into 2 Kings chapter number 4. 2 Kings chapter number 4 tells the unique story of a widow woman who comes to the prophet. When you begin to think about her predicament, the challenges of the circumstances surrounding her life, the pain and the panic that begins to set in because of what she is enduring. Her husband is dead and he's gone too soon for the Bible tells us she has two young sons. Her husband is a good man, a man of God, a prophet attending the school of the prophets. He has dedicated his family to the kingdom. They're helping to restore the worship of Jehovah, the one true God under the guidance of Elisha, the prophet. He attends the school of the prophets. But the creditors have come, and they're going to take her sons as slaves to help pay the bills if she can't come up with the resources to meet the need. So we join this story, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse number 1. One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out to him. You can sense her intention. You can sense her desperation as she cries out to him, my husband who served you is dead. And you know how he feared the Lord. You know how he served you. You know how he served the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. And Elisha asked the question of her, what can I do to help? Tell me, what do you have in the house? What do you have available? It, I have no doubt God could have provided the need right then and there. He could have taken care. Whatever the bill was, he could have provided the means to pay it. But Elisha asked this question, what do you have in the house? What's available at your disposal? What resources do you have? And she says this, it's interesting because her first response is nothing. Well, I have something, but it seems like nothing. Nothing at all, except a flask of olive oil, she replied. Obviously, in the face of the need, that resource was never going to meet the need. It might as well have been nothing because it would not come close to providing to meet the need that she had. Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said to her, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jar, setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her and she filled one after 
another. You can see them going throughout the neighborhood. They're begging, they're borrowing, they're doing whatever they can, finding every jug and jar and dish, and no matter the size, and we need everything that we can get. And they're bringing those vessels back home. And here is their mother with that flask of olive oil. And she pours until it's empty, or at least until it should be empty. But it just continues to pour. And they bring another vessel and she pours and and it just continues to flow one after another until the house and is overflowing with vessels and their vessels are overflowing with oil and you can imagine their excitement and their amazement um, as she just continues to pour what an absolutely miraculous supernatural occurrence that oil just continues to flow it was an act of miraculous provision Remember, we, we, we asked that question a few moments ago. How do I increase my capacity? You see, the widow was powerless to increase the oil. She was powerless to do anything about that provision of oil. The principle is this. The miracle always belongs to God. That was, that was God's area that was what god was responsible for it it goes on to say in verse number six and soon every container was full to the brim bring me another jar she said to one of her sons there aren't any more he told her and then the olive oil stopped flowing when the last vessel was filled the olive oil stopped flowing as long as the vessels were empty The oil continued to flow. But once capacity was reached, the oil stopped. You see, this is the principle, the miracle. The oil was the Lord's. But the capacity was her responsibility. Borrow as many jars as you can. Talk to all of your friends, your family, your neighbors. Go everywhere you can and get all of the vessels that you can find. And as long as there were empty vessels, the anointing oil continued to flow. Her current resources were not enough. And so she had to recognize the area of need and began to increase her capacity. The issue wasn't the oil. The issue was the capacity. The issue wasn't the anointing. and The issue was having enough jars to be filled. And here is this widow woman and her sons humble enough to reach out to the friends and the family who were around them to take what they had and incorporate it into their life. To go next door and say, hey, I have a need. To go to the person across the street and say, I don't have what it takes. Do you have any jars? I've got to get everything I can because I have a need and I don't have enough resources in my home. I don't have enough resources within myself to take care of the need, but you have something that can help meet my need. You have something across the aisle that can help meet my need. You have something in your home that can help meet my need. You see, she didn't, she didn't make her capacity problem God's problem. She didn't say, well, if If God wanted me to have more jars, he would have given me more jars. If he wanted me to have greater capacity, then he would have made sure I had more jars. No, she addressed her own area of need. She confronted her own lack of capacity and said, we got to do whatever it takes to get more jars. And when she confronted her own lack of capacity, then God started working the miracle. The miracle is the Lord's. The capacity is our responsibility. It took some honest transparency. We don't have what it takes. We don't have it all together in order to increase your personal capacity it's going to take some transparent honesty 
to say, I don't have it all together, to target the areas of lack and to learn from somebody else's experience, to hear somebody else's testimony, to ask somebody else, I need you to pray with me. I need you to partner with me. I need you to study with me. I've got some questions and I don't have it all figured out, but you've been living for God for a while. I'm struggling in this area and God brought you out of that area. I need some help. It requires that humility. It requires partnering together. It requires us recognizing I can't do this on my own, but I'm part of a great body. You see the way that we increase capacity is me taking my experience and partnering with you with your experience. And you take somebody else's anointing, somebody else's sacrifice, somebody else's vision, and you start to partner it together. And before long, you see the increase of capacity. They didn't have what it took in their home. They had to reach out to those that were around them. There were things that others had that they needed. It takes initiative. It takes personal awareness and personal vision to recognize there's some areas that I need to work on. There's some areas that I, I lack some things in that area. It takes initiative to develop some new skills to increase your faith, to take the time to develop those personal daily disciplines of prayer, fasting, reading the word, witnessing. Take some personal initiative, personal awareness and personal initiative. The miracle is the Lord's, but the capacity is our responsibility. You see, what God does through your life, what God accomplishes through you is, is, is going to be his area. That, that's the, the thing that God does. Ultimately, the final result is going to be God's work. We can't take credit for that. But the, the extent of what God does, the magnitude of what God can do through us, in so many ways, and is dependent upon us increasing our personal capacity. The oil will, will continue to flow as long as the jars are still empty, as they keep coming, as we increase that capacity. It's not the will of God for you just to survive. He wants you to thrive in his kingdom, but it's our responsibility to increase our personal capacity capacity. Don't make your capacity problem God's problem. God's not going to give you more hours in the day. God, just can I please, let's let this be a 26-hour day. I've got a few extra things to get done. God's not going to make you smarter. You're going to have to study. You're going to have to invest some time. God's not just going to download into your mind. I made this declaration on Sunday. I'm going to say it again. We will have a Spanish-speaking daughter work here at Christian Life Center. We're going to have it. But guess what? I'm not expecting to wake up in the morning and God give me a dream, or in my dream I go through like a 27-course lesson plan in speaking Spanish. And I wake up in the morning and I'm fluent. Probably not going to happen. If I'm going to learn Spanish, I'm going to have to study it. I'm going to have to spend some time. God's not just going to do that. It's our responsibility to increase our capacity. And as we increase our capacity, then the anointing can flow through that increased capacity. If I learn how to speak Spanish, guess what? I can preach in Spanish. If I learn how to play the piano then I can play the piano to the glory of God. Now, I, I've heard some amazing testimonies about somebody sitting down and the anointing flowing, and they, they played the piano just amazingly and had never had a lesson, and just incredible. Don't depend on that. We're not going to let you up here to play. Brother Dave is going to make sure that you can play. We're, we're not going that route. you got to apply yourself. You have to be 
diligent. You have to spend time. You have to study. You have to prepare. That is the increasing of capacity. You learn how to play the piano. Guess what? The anointing of God can flow through you while you play the piano. You increase that capacity. That is our responsibility. God is not just going to bring people and line them up at the, at the door out here and say, okay, here they, they are. Here's all the people that need God. Here's all the people that are hungry for God. People are probably not going to line up at your door in the morning and knock and saying, will you please teach me a Bible study? That's our responsibility to increase that capacity. But guess what? When you go and you ask that person, do you want a Bible study? And you sit down and start to teach, the anointing of God is going to flow through that increased capacity. We don't pray about capacity. We work capacity. We enlarge it. We increase it. We don't pray, God, would you give me more jars? That's not what the the prophet said. That's not what what Elisha said to do. And that's not what the lady and her sons did. They didn't say, okay, God, we need more jars. God, will you please send us more jars? We're believing even in a preacher's voice. We're believing for more jars because, you know, praying is more effective when you're praying in a preacher's voice. So God, send us more jars. We're believing that there's going to be jars lined up across the front tonight. We're believing there's going to be jars filling our living room tonight. That's not what happened. Said, go, go to your friends and your family, your neighbors, and everybody you can find, and go get the jars. And go get them and bring them back home. It's your responsibility. We don't pray, God, make me more successful. Do the kind of things, think the kind of thoughts, have the kind of behavior that successful people have, and guess what? You'll be successful pastor was praying this prayer one time read it in his book very successful pastor who prayed the prayer god give us a church of a thousand and god rebuked him and said you be the kind of pastor that can pastor a thousand and you'll have a thousand people that's called increasing capacity it's more about being than just doing be the kind of person with the kind of character and integrity that can handle the blessings of God and success and even financial blessings. And I believe the blessings of God will flow. The anointing will flow when we increase capacity. We don't pray the prayer, God, make me more focused. How about we just turn the technology off for a few minutes every day and get more focused. We don't pray, God, give me more rest. What if we just went to bed earlier? You see, capacity is our responsibility. The miracle is God's responsibility. God has placed people all around us. He has placed opportunities all around us that can help us grow and increase that capacity. It's our responsibility to take the initiative, to reach out, to go. If you're waiting on somebody to reach out to you, you may be waiting a long time. Take the personal initiative and say, I'm going to go. I'm going to reach out. I'm going to increase my capacity by connecting with the people that God has placed around me. And I'm going to connect with their experience and their testimony and their anointing and their prayer life and their purpose. I'm going to connect with that and increase my capacity. The miracle was the Lord's. The responsibility to increase capacity was the widow's. How do we increase capacity? Our spiritual disciplines every day, every day, every day, praying, fasting, reading the word increases capacity. Being around the right people, the right influences, the right voices increases capacity. Studying the word of God increases capacity. Being honest with yourself about your own needs, those gaps, those weaknesses in your life, just that awareness alone begins to increase capacity. Increased car 
Consecration increases the anointing of God. Lifestyle, principles of holiness, separation from the world increases capacity. Elim eliminating those things from our lives that hinder capacity. Like the apostle Paul said, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and run with patience that race that is set before us. That's eliminating things that hinder capacity. Our behavior has to match our belief system, has to, to match what we say that we want. We talked about this through our vision and value series over and over and over again, that our, it, it's not what we say we believe. It's not what we say we value. Our behavior, our actions are a physical manifestation of our value system. We can't do one thing and expect something else. The widow couldn't sit there in her living room waiting for the miracle to happen. Well, God sure is taking his time. I've got a need. The creditors are coming. My sons are going to be taken. Man, I wish God would respond a lot quicker. And here God is just waiting. He's got buckets of oil lined up in heaven waiting to pour them out, looking for some vessels, some increased capacity for somebody to make that vessel, that jar available so he can get to pouring. I just have this sense, uh, this feeling uh, that God's got some bucket loads of anointing uh, and provision and blessing uh, that are available for somebody. He's just looking for a place to put it. Um, he's looking for a place to pour it out. Um, he's looking for some increased consecration. He's looking for some increased capacity saying, I've got it. Um, I've got the miracle I've got the blessing I've got the provision it's here I just need a place to pour it out one of my one of my favorite people in the world is a, a, a comedian by the name of Brian Regan anybody fans of Brian Regan I, I, I love this one little sketch that he does where he goes to the doctor and he's believing that his cholesterol number is going to be down but the JP is a big Brian Regan fan. He's just believing. I mean, I know he, he's, he's basically praying. I mean, he's begging. He's, please, please, please. I know that cholesterol number is going to be down. And so the doctor comes back and it's up like 25%. What? Then he says, it's inexplicable. And I love the way he says that. It's just inexplicable. Burger King coupons in his pocket right here. Just, it's inexplicable. Our behavior has to match our value system. And if we say, God, I want more power, more anointing, more glory, more provision, more blessing, more finances, more purpose, whatever it is, we have to take the initiative and increase the capacity and give God a place to put that blessing. Give God a place to pour out that anointing. It's inexplicable. It's not going to be a good excuse when you're standing before God. It's just inexplicable, God. When you think about a, a ship with sails, and I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. I, I told you we got week two. I don't know, maybe we're going to have week three too. I, I don't know. You think about a ship with sails. The, the, the wind is the spirit of God blowing. The sails are our responsibility. The sail is our responsibility. If all you have is a pole just sticking up there with no sail and the wind is just blowing ferociously and you're just turning in circles saying, God, why are we going nowhere? We're not making any progress here. What's happening? Look at my neighbor over there. Look how fast they're going. Big sails, full of wind. And we're sitting here saying, we got like a, a paper napkin taped to our mast <laughs> what is happening here God this is not funny we're not going anywhere and our friend our neighbor over here has like the blimp <laughs> filled up sailing toward purpose destination anointing it's about capacity the momentum of sacrifice, the greater the sacrifice, the wider we span those sails, the greater we increase our capacity, the more influence there is from the wind. 
Think about that. As we increase that capacity, the more influence there is from the wind. Small sail, little influence. Great big sail, tremendous influence from the wind. Discipline in those six areas that I I mentioned to you, spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, relational, financial, those six areas, the sum of those six areas of capacity. We're going to talk more about those when we, when we come back and talk again. It'll be in two weeks when I'm back after general conference. When we talk about those six areas, that increased capacity is the result of intentional behavior. When all of those areas are working together, and if there's any one of those areas where there's limited capacity, it becomes a limiting factor in all the other areas in our life. But every time that you go to the Lord in prayer, you're collecting another jar. You go in an extended fast, and you're collecting more jars. You worship God in the middle of the storm. doesn't make any sense. Others don't understand what you're doing. You're just collecting jars. You invest in that friendship, that relationship, that disciple that you're spending time with. Others may not understand the investment. You're just collecting more jars. You give of yourself sacrificially, your time, your talent, your treasure. Others don't understand the sacrifice, but you're just collecting more jars. I want you to stand with me tonight. A friend of mine made this statement recently that just kind of shook me He said this, he said, every life is perfectly structured for the results it is getting right now. Every life is perfectly structured for the results it's getting right now. It's in alignment with what I said at the very beginning of this message. We have as much God as we want. We have as much God as we want. I don't want to miss out on a greater miracle because I lacked capacity. Our problem tonight is not God's ability. Our problem is not God's provision. Our problem is not God's resources. He has unlimited resources. There is unlimited oil, unlimited anointing that is ready to be poured out. The problem is not God's ability. It's our capacity. That little widow woman and her two sons, they pounded the pavement. They went everywhere that they could, did everything that they could to collect as many jars as possible, increasing capacity, increasing capacity. I I want to encourage somebody in the Holy Ghost tonight. I, I want to encourage you to increase your capacity because there is a miracle that is coming. There's a miracle that God's working right now. There's a blessing on the way. God's provision is ready to be poured out. I want to challenge you and encourage you to increase your capacity tonight because the greater you increase that capacity, the greater the miracle is going to be. The more jars you collect, the anointing is going to flow. That provision is going to come. I feel it so strongly in the Holy Ghost tonight to challenge you. Increase your capacity because God is ready to work the miracle. I want you to look at what God did. The final verse I'll read from 2 Kings chapter 4 verse number 7. She tells the man of God what happened. She tells Elisha, here's what we did. We went and collected all the jars we could find. And you're not going to believe this preacher. He's just smiling. I knew God was going to do it. You're not going to believe this. As long as we kept bringing jars in, the oil kept flowing. And they were all overflowing. She tells the man of God what happened. Here we are. We've got all these jars filling our house full of oil. And this is what he says to her. Now sell the olive oil and pay your debts. And you and your sons can live on what is left over. She increased her capacity 
to meet the impossible need that she was facing. And when she did that in honor of her faith, uh, her submission, her obedience to God, uh, he not only provided what she needed to meet the need, uh, she not only paid the creditors off, um, but the prophet said, now you um, and your sons uh, are going to live on the leftovers, uh, the abundance, uh, the overflow of God's provision. He met their current need, uh, but he also met their future needs. Uh, God said, uh, I'm going to take care of you today, but because of your faithfulness, uh, because of your sacrifice, uh, because you increased your capacity, I'm going to take care of your future needs. The Holy Ghost is speaking to somebody right now, challenging you. Increase that capacity. Come on, that's your responsibility. The miracle is mine. The Lord's saying the miracle is mine. I can do it. I can take care of it. If you'll just increase that capacity. I want you to close your eyes right now all over this sanctuary. I know we've taken some time tonight. But I believe the Holy Ghost is speaking to some hearts right now. God is challenging someone. I've asked you this question, how much God do you want in your life? I believe it'd be a tragedy tonight to not give you opportunity to increase capacity tonight. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that your anointing, Lord, would flow right now into this sanctuary. God, you know the cry of every heart. Some tonight who come with tremendous needs and some who walked into this sanctuary tonight desperate, looking for an answer, desperate with circumstances facing them that are absolutely impossible. And they came tonight, Lord, needing your provision. I'm praying right now that somebody would respond to the call of the Spirit and answer and meet that challenge to increase capacity. God, whatever it takes uh, to collect those jars and whatever it takes uh, to increase my personal capacity, I'm willing to make that sacrifice. And God, I'm going to be diligent and whatever it takes, God, because I want the greatest miracle that you have available for me. I want everything you have for me. God, I'm opening my heart to you because I want more of you. I want more anointing. I want more power. I want more purpose. God, I need more of you in my life God I open these altars right now to anybody who would like to step out and make this commitment to God and make this declaration tonight that I'm going to increase my capacity God because I want the greatest miracle that you have available for me I want your provision I want your anointing I want greater purpose and God whatever it is that you have for me I'm making myself available I'm going to increase my capacity God if you're looking for a place to pour out a blessing here I am if you're looking for a place God to work a miracle here I am God if you're looking for somebody to transform here I am God if you're looking for somebody tonight to do a supernatural work in them if you're looking for somebody to heal here I am if you're looking for somebody to deliver here I am if you're looking for somebody to save God here I am I want more of you I want more of you